Well, thanks for joining us today to learn more about the technical assistance services provided by the Just Transition Fund. I'm Cindy Winland, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Emily Rhodes, and we'll be talking about the technical planning services that the Just Transition Fund offers. And with us today are four speakers who will highlight the work of the Fund's Transition Assistance Program and how these partnerships have supported sustainable economic diversification. Their bios and other contact information will be available at the end of the webinar. So a little bit of housekeeping. All participants are on mute and will be throughout the presentation. We encourage questions, so if you have any, please put them in the chat box. You can see that highlighted here. And we're recording, so we'll be able to send you a link afterwards and you can see it on our website. The fund was established five years ago to address the needs of the community to transition away from coal. The energy transition is complex and it will require more than one type of strategy or solution. So this is why we focus on several key strategies as part of our framework, and you can see them listed here. The fund's overarching goal is to build resilient communities by advancing economic solutions that are equitable, inclusive, and sustainable. And this is what we mean by just transition. So our approach is unique. We believe that problems need both funding and technical assistance. And you can see here that uh, in today's webinar, we're going to focus on the technical assistance portion of the work. A couple of important aspects of our work. We're nonpartisan, we're neutral, and this allows us to bring all voices to the table and gain a diverse range of stakeholders. And we're completely supported, so there's no cost to your community or your organization. And a few more things that we think are important to know about our work. We only go where we're invited. We bring a national perspective. We share our experience and expertise rather than arriving with solutions and work hard to support the best ideas that are generated locally. We know that building trust with the organizations we work with is important to help you be impactful. So our TA team, we'll introduce ourselves, is me and I'm on the right and my colleague Emily Rhodes is on the left. We both spent a lot of time on the ground in our careers, working in communities facing similar disruptions in their economies from a variety of causes. We're both based in the Midwest, but we've worked throughout the U.S. We both have planning degrees and years of working in local governments. We also know that planning for change, and particularly often unwelcome change, is hard. And most importantly, though, we love what we do, and we hope it shows when we work in your community. So here's where we work. You can see the states in the dark green are current priority states. The states in the light green are places where we've worked but we're not, are not current priority states. So since 2017, our technical assistance work has supported 26 communities across eight states. And we're currently focusing our work in the eight states, as I mentioned, in dark green. And just as an aside, our priority states, and there's more, these are the ones that we've worked in for, with technical assistance, uh, are chosen through a data-driven process to identify the most vulnerable populations. So here's a few things we've learned from experience, the things that we think are the most important. We think that it's really important to uh, plan ahead. We know that early planning fosters better long-term outcomes. We also know that most plants are gonna close at some time in the future, and it's not too early to think about the impacts, the impacts of the tax loss, the job loss, and the changes in the social fabric of the community, because all those things will happen. So a couple examples here, this is in Becker, Minnesota, an example of a community that um, began planning years before the expected date of the full closure of the Sherburne County Generating Station. The city administrator has been working for years to get the city to move beyond its dependence on coal. And we've worked with Becker and Sherburne County to help them plan for these changes with community engagement, identifying funding opportunities for additional infrastructure and continued support. And as a result, they're ready to retool the surrounding property and infrastructure with new tax producing uses and ready to entertain Google's potential use of the former plant as a data center. So um, lots of credit to them. Early planning has paid off for the community, although not without its challenges. Another thing we've learned is that having a plan is essential to making progress toward a new future. We call them roadmaps. Not all roadmaps or the stages of their creation look the same. Strategies and tactics are only valuable if they're executed and plans are only worthwhile if they're implemented. 
So no sitting on the shelf for anything that we work on. One size does not fit all, and we work with you to figure out what's most beneficial locally. So sometimes the plans can be part of a wider co comprehensive plan, much like we see in land use planning. They can be part of an economic development plan, much like a comprehensive economic development strategy or other federally sanctioned process. And we'll hear about one of those in Hampton Township, Michigan. We can also support the plan through facilitation of the process to create the plan. And we'll hear about that experience in Colstrip, Montana. We've worked to gather the data, help, help communities and organizations gather the data to determine impacts. And we'll hear about that in Minnesota. We've supported programs and resources to implement the plan. And then we'll hear a little bit about starting a new nonprofit. So an example of a plan, we've worked in Tonawanda, New York, which is a suburb of Buffalo, to help them put together a plan to address their economic diversification options, particularly in their industrial corridor, which is home to the former Huntley coal plant. A team, including planners, labor, and an environmental group that has been the driving force behind the plan's formation, worked to create a great example of the value of a comprehensive roadmap. We acted as the catalyst to help local players see how best to achieve their responsibilities under the plan. And that meant helping them find funding, work with other agencies and groups, and generally having a high level role in getting the plan to fruition. And a third lesson we'd like to point out here is that we know that the people who are living with the experience of a major economic change are the experts in their community on the impacts and the solutions. And we'll hear from them in this webinar, as we mentioned. Our intent is to augment your work with our experiences and resources, but not to replace it. We listen well, we've seen this before, and we can help identify opportunities or gaps where our technical assistance or resources may be helpful. Locally derived solutions are the most likely to succeed because local people are committed to their success and they know what's needed. And an example of this in Adams County, Ohio, home to two closed coal plants, there was denial and resistance to the impending closure of these plants. And a group of local people who had been struggling for years to get any kind of assistance from the state to help address these huge losses in tax revenues that they knew were likely to result in school, closing, has, school closings had been going on. This group got together to establish the Adams County Community Foundation and a scholarship fund focusing on providing opportunities to learn trades and skills that would make them marketable for living wage jobs in the future. We've supported the community members who are part of this locally developed solution. And now I'll turn it over to Emily. So please meet my technical assistance colleague, Emily Rhodes, to talk about the process. Thanks, Cindy. So Cindy just highlighted some of the places where we've worked in the past, and in a few minutes you'll hear from four of our other partners about the work that we've done together to advance transitions in their communities. And as you're listening to these speakers, we hope that you can see your community in this work and identify commonalities where we may be able to partner. And these partnerships come about in uh, many ways, but it starts with having a conversation. So connect with us. You can reach us at the email addresses listed below, or we have a web form on our site at the link listed on the slide. And in our initial conversation, we'll discuss your community contacts, the, the impacts and challenges that you're seeing, and your goals for your uh, transition planning efforts. After the initial conversation, we'll explore what might come next together. So we'll discuss things like, um, what are the tasks or areas of expertise um, or areas where our expertise may be able to fill a need in your work. What does your timeline look like or major milestones? Um, and what other planning processes may be taking place that we can build on and grow? And when we align on what partnership and support might look like, um, then we'll take action to create that plan or roadmap to accelerate your efforts. So when we talk about partnering with local nonprofits and local communities um, to take action, as Cindy mentioned, it can happen at all stages of creating a roadmap or a plan to move forward. And so some of those actions on the ground might look like starting a coordinated community-driven transition planning process, like identifying who those leaders are or community um, residents are that are looking to advance the transition, like the example Cindy gave in Adams County. Um, we can help identify public and private funding sources. 
We know that in each stage of a transition, it often requires a diverse set of funding and technical assistance support. And so we can help you identify some opportunities there, as well as provide grant writing support to go after um, those funding uh, programs. We can assist in conducting outreach to affected stakeholders and residents and facilitate meetings um, among groups who may have disparate viewpoints and bring them to the table to talk about their idea for the ideas for the future. It might also look like sharing information and resources or connecting your community with our partners or other communities and case studies where programs, policies, and projects have had success. We see our work as part of a locally driven process that can include some combination of all of these different types of activities. And based on the work that we've done with communities in the field, there's a number of lessons that we've learned and processes we've seen that have worked in many places. And so um, with that information and informed by that, we've created a series of resources to share with the field. One of those resources is our new uh, blueprint for transition. Uh, this resource includes years of feedback and best thinking from transition leaders from across all regions. And it's an interactive website that's, that's up on our, our JTF site right now. That's meant to be a tool, um, kind of a how-to guide for local nonprofits um, and local community leaders who are just starting to think about what economic diversification looks like in their community. So maybe you just found out that there's going to be an industry shift in your community and you're starting to ask, what next? How do I get started? This, um, this resource has a series of tools uh, to support that, those efforts. And within the broader blueprint, you'll find a series of additional resources for download, such as our Find Federal Funding page. It's a list of many of the resources that communities have access to advance different stages of their transition efforts. It also includes resources such as um, our understanding trauma and adversity document. So we know that economic transition away from coal assets can have a profound impact on communities and workers. And this resource provides background on how this trauma may arise and things to consider if it is present in your community. And we'll keep posting new resources as we continue to partner with groups and le learn more from the field. So you can stay up to date on our website and also there's an, an option to sign up for our mailing list where we um, announce the, the release of these, um, these types of resources. So you can go to our website and sign up there. So now I'd like to turn it over to our first speaker um, to share how they're working to advance transitions in their community. So Terry uh, Close um, is, is the supervisor of Hampton Township and she's currently managing an EDA grant to develop an economic development strategy plan. Terry? Thank you, Emily. As um, Emily mentioned, I am the supervisor for Hampton Township. I was appointed in 2017 and elected to the position in 2018. Hampton Township has a population of 9,452, and it's located in Bay County, Michigan. I'm sure that um, you can see why we call it the Mitten State. We Michiganders like to hold up our hand and point to where we live, and that works really well for us. In this slide where you see the yellow star, that is where two coal plants are located. The J.C. Wedak coal plant was retired in 2016, and the D.E. Carn coal plant is scheduled to retire in 2023. In the next slide, outlined in red is the boundaries for Hampton Township. It's 28.1 square miles in size and it has nine miles of shoreline. Unfortunately, our shoreline doesn't have any beaches and most of the shoreline property is owned by consumers or the Michigan Department of Natural Resources, DNR, and is protected and not developable. Approximately 50% of our township is farmland, and we do have several small commercial areas and some industrial areas. The picture with the aerial view, it shows the two coal plants that are located on the mouth of the Saginaw River. Being close to the bay provides easy access to cooling water for the coal plants. In red, in the red circle, is the Wedot coal plant. 
And as I mentioned, that was decommissioned in 2016. It is currently in the process of being demolished. One half of the yellow building above the red circle is the Carn 1 and 2 coal plant. And that will be decommissioned in 2023 and the demolition of that facility will begin. The other half of the yellow building is Carn 3 and 4, which runs on natural gas and fuel oil and is scheduled for retirement in 2031. Once all the plants are demolished, it will become a brownfield. And we are told that Consumers Energy plans to evaluate redevelopment options for that site. So what does it mean for Hampton Township and what does it mean for any area that is losing a coal plant? The obvious is the loss of property tax revenue for the township, the city, and the county. This means less funding for operating public safety roads on a township level, but also for things like 911 dispatch, libraries, senior citizens, and veterans programs. And then it also impacts the schools, colleges, um, skilled trade and special education funding. There is also the loss of jobs for those that work in the plants. The employees may be offered relocation opportunities within the company locally or elsewhere, but if they do need to relocate, they may need to sell their home and move their children out of the school system that they currently attend. And it also affects the businesses that these coal plants purchase from, the supply chain. When I became supervisor in 2017 and was working on my first budget, I looked at the trend of the township's tax revenue, and I found that before the planned closure of the coal plant, over 50% of our township's general fund property tax revenue was from consumers' energy. With reviewing the trend, it showed that consumers' tax revenue had gone down every year for the last 10 years, and now today, it accounts for about 23% of our total taxes that the township collects. Each year, we were dipping into our fund balance to cover our expenditures. And what I found was that the township tax revenue was decreasing on average about $100,000 per year for the last 10 years. So seeing this, it was painfully obvious that this was something that needed to be tackled head on. We needed to be proactive, plan for the future losses and revenue. And the only thing that we were able to do in the short term was to reduce our expenditures, which we have done and we are continuing to work on. But what we also needed to look at was ways to increase our tax revenue or replace what we were losing. And what we could do is to work towards diversifying our economy. And we needed to begin thinking and planning for alternative uses for available land that can be developed and market and find new uses for available empty buildings such as our local mall. So the next slide shows the partners that work together to make this program happen. Through a contact person at Consumers Energy and getting updates on the coal plant closures, I was introduced to Cindy Winland at the Just Transition Fund. And through conversations that we had, I learned how Just Transition Fund helps coal impacted communities transition after coal plant closures. And through these discussions, I learned about the EDA's Economic Development Administration Grant for coal impacted communities. This is when I really got excited because I felt that Hampton Township could really benefit from an economic redevelopment strategy plan, a roadmap on how we can accomplish economic diversification and plan for a future without consumers energy. I have to admit that going through the grant application process was pretty intimidating since the grant funding is awarded on a competitive base, basis nationwide. The Just Transition Fund technical assistance staff encouraged us to meet with the EDA and they helped to arrange that introduction. They were very instrumental in creating a grant application that would be competitive by helping to write and edit the grant narrative and the application itself. 
they also were a valuable resource for me on where to go to obtain information and find data that was needed as well as translating the federal speak and terminology into terms that I could understand. And they helped me to navigate the online application process that um, was a bit challenging and not as easy as one might think. Just Transition Fund helped to identify these partners that would be important to the entire process. Even after being awarded the grant, Just Transition Fund technical staff had been an active participant on, participant on the steering committee by reviewing the consultant's draft strategy plan. Without Just Transition Fund's just their generous contribution, their help, knowledge, expertise, and their willingness to be a partner from the beginning to end, I can honestly say that I don't think that this could have even been possible. Just Transition Fund was able to help fund this project by using a hybrid approach. They generously awarded $17,000 to our local community foundation to contribute to the match dollars needed. We also received a contribution from Consumers Energy, and ultimately we received $100,000 in grant funds. We hired a planning consultant to help us create a strategy plan for economic success. And the plan is currently in the final stages and will be complete this month. It was a collaborative effort from the beginning and a huge learning experience for me. As I mentioned, Just Transition Fund helped with funding this project as well as developing our grant identification. This strategy for economic success includes community input and strategic development planning from our consultants and local economic development staff. We believe that the best outcomes are community driven so that the recommendations and the implementation items in the plan are important locally and so that they are well received. Just Transition Fund helped us identify a roadmap to our new economic identity. This is the first time that our township has had an economic development plan that is actionable both locally and regionally. And with the support of the county's economic development organization and the demands identified for land and industry in the area, we have been given a strategy that will help us attract new industry sectors and help to expand those that we have into regional hubs. Opportunities have been identified for new businesses and expanding businesses where significant spending leakage is taking place. We understand that we are not going to be able to replace all the tax base we'll lose with the closure of the plants in the near future, but we hope that we can bring new opportunities and diversification to rebuild the tax base. We also look forward to the days following the decommissioning and sale of the consumer's energy property, which will be sometime after 2031, that we will see another use for that property that adds to our community either recreationally, industrially, or even in a way that we can't envision yet. In closing, I can't thank Just Transition Fund enough for being a partner with Hampton Township and assisting not only with funding, but also providing the technical expertise to make this project possible. Thank you. Thanks so much, Terry. Um, that was a huge undertaking, producing a full economic roadmap um, like you did. And next we'll hear from Audrey Partridge. Uh, Audrey is with the Center for Energy and Environment, talking about a research project that informs roadmaps statewide. Audrey? Hi, I'm Audrey Partridge. I'm the Regulatory Policy Manager at Center for Energy and Environment, a Minnesota-based nonprofit. I think we'll just jump in since we have such limited time. Uh, first, a little about Center for Energy and Environment and the perspective we bring to these issues. CEE is a Minnesota-based clean energy nonprofit that dates back more than 40 years with deep organizational expertise in energy efficiency and other clean energy solutions. CEE employs about 160 people across a wide variety of areas, and our organizational mission 
which underlies all of our work is to discover and deploy the most effective energy solutions that both strengthen the economy and improve the environment. CEE has offices in Minneapolis and St. Paul, but most of our host community work so far has focused on these six communities, which are located all the way from the very southeastern part of our state up to the uh, middle north of our state. Now to our community work with the Just Transition Fund. CEE worked with the Just Transition Fund and a number of other project partners on an impact analysis of five power plants across six communities that you just saw. Before I dive into the project, I wanna provide a little bit of context. Minnesota, like so many states across the nation, is in the midst of a major transition in how we generate our electricity. We are moving from a predominantly coal-fired coal -fired generation fleet of large central plants to a more diverse and less carbon intensive fleet with high levels of renewable energy resources. This is of course resulting in the closure of some of our state's largest power plants and big complex challenges for the communities that host those plants. Many of our Minnesota communities have really started to take some initial steps to try to mitigate the impact of an eventual power plant closure, but are still in the early phases of transition planning and implementation. Our impact analysis was a key early step to develop a good detailed understanding of how communities will be affected by their power plants closure so that they could develop transition and economic development plans that will be necessary for the successful transition of their communities. To take this initial step, CEE and the Just Transition Fund, along with a number of other project partners that included those power plant communities and the utility owners of those, those power plants, teamed up to assess the social and economic impacts of several Minnesota's largest power plants, all of which will be uh, eligible for retirement over the next five to 15 years on communities and workers. The collaboration resulted in two separate types of analyses, and those were both released earlier this year. As I mentioned, the study included several of our largest power plants, and actually there were five, two coal plants and two nuclear plants owned by Xcel Energy, Minnesota's largest electric provider, and one coal plant owned by Minnesota Power, our second largest electric provider. Starting at the top left here, we have the Allen S. King plant located in Oak Park Heights, the Sherburne County Generating Center, or SHRCO, located in Becker, as Cindy mentioned earlier, the Boswell Energy Center, located in Cohasset, and then bottom left is the Monticello Nuclear Plant, and bottom right is the Prairie Island Nuclear Plant. And for that plant, it's located in Red Wing, but it's actually on land that was previously part of the Prairie Island Indian community. And so really there are sort of two host communities for that plant. Um, as I noted, the overall project really included two separate efforts and two separate types of analyses. The first is the CEE study titled Minnesota's Power Plant Communities, An Uncertain Future, and it primarily relied on qualitative data from interviews and a community survey. And it was augmented with some additional quantitative data that we collected from individual communities, utilities, and other experts. This study provided rich context for each of the communities, which is critical for identifying appropriate and effective transition strategies. The study delves into the regional economy and the mix of local industries and businesses in the community, the importance and the role of the tax revenue from the power plants, the community's history with the plants, and even the collective emotions about the community and the plants themselves. We work very closely with the Just Transition Fund and representatives from all the communities on this project. The second study focused on the hard numbers and was conducted by the University of Colorado at Boulder Lead School of Business. UCB used an economic modeling software to estimate the dollar and job impact of a plant retirement on the host community at the county level and the state level. CEE oversaw that study and helped facilitate the scoping, contracting, and communication between the UCB team and the community representatives and utilities. Now to how we worked with the Just Transition Fund. For our project, the Just Transition Fund was really there at every stage. Cindy Winlin at JTF helped to identify the need for the impact analysis and to convene the coalition of stakeholders that became project partners. 
JPF was a major funder of these studies, and because JPF provided their funding, we were also able to get a broad range of other funders, and we ended up with funders all the way from the utility to local regional initiative funds to the JPF. Cindy provided technical guidance in developing the scope and the economic analysis, um, I'm sorry, the scope of the economic analysis study and helped the coalition of stakeholders involved to better understand the limitations and possibilities of various economic modeling approaches. And finally, Cindy provided her own subject matter expertise on community transition best practices and case studies around the country, and also connected me and my co-author with her own network of experts on those issues. So now to the key outcomes of having these studies. Um, these studies have certainly increased the knowledge and understanding of community and worker transition issues um, among the important decision makers in our state. We've seen a heightened focus on community and worker transition issues from regulators, legislators, advocates, and even the media. For an example or two, the Minnesota Public Utilities Commission hosted a planning meeting that was entirely focused on this topic and the CEE Power Plant Community Report. And the commission has even included a utility metric in a docket on performance-based regulation intended to capture the utility's impact on communities and workers, including what happens after plant retirement. Our state legislature passed a bill this year that will provide funding for power plant communities to plan and implement transition strategies. And CEE worked with a coalition of organizations on this effort and used these studies to help educate legislators on the need for that funding. And finally, one of the key outcomes has been the community's interest and progress in pursuing formal transition planning efforts. So finally, why is this impactful? Uh, first, not to be cheesy, but knowledge certainly empowers. Without a deep understanding of the community and the plant workers, transition strategies can actually miss the mark. Next, the additional funding opportunities as provided by the legislation this year will be critical for funding efforts, especially as communities face budget constraints as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Increased awareness of these issues tends to increase support for communities. Anecdotally, we've seen greater attention and support for community and worker issues from other clean energy advocates in the regulatory sphere. And finally, the impact analysis was shaped and driven by the communities, which helps to ensure that communities can and will be able to use this analysis to help inform them and guide them in their ongoing transition efforts. And I shouldn't have said finally before, why does a successful and just community and worker transition matter to Minnesota? First, we believe that supporting communities and workers through a just, equitable, and successful transition is going to lead to a faster, smoother, and better transition to a low-carbon economy. We believe that it will also lead to more equitable distribution of the benefits of that low-carbon economy, both in terms of economic benefits and environmental benefits. And we believe and hope that in turn, a successful and just transition for communities and workers will help to remove some of the factors that tend to create divisions in our state. So if you're interested in learning more, there's the web address there at the bottom of the slide and you can follow our work on these topics. And that's all for me. Thanks, Audrey. Um, we're excited to hear about all the work that is, is happening there. Uh, and next, I will turn it over to Sabrina Nyman. Sabrina is an integral part of the transition process in Coal Strip, Montana, and she's currently managing the Department of Labor grant to retain workers from the Coal Strip power plant and mine on behalf of the AFL-CIO. Go ahead, Sabrina. Thanks for having me today. I'm Sabrina Nyman. I'm a community member of Coal Strip, Montana. I was raised here, left for college, and returned 10 years later. So growing up in Coal Strip, I would say we were very spoiled. We have a tremendous park system, state-of-the-art rec center, a very low crime rate, and it's very apparent that our schools had more money than those around us. Um, my husband and I agree that this is where we wanna stay and raise our children despite what happens with the coal industry. Um, I guess you could say I pretty much grew up in a coal mine. My dad worked there the first 20 years of my life, and now he works just across the road at the power plant. My mom is the purchasing agent at the coal mine and they gave me my first job while I was in high school. When I returned to Coal Strip, I was hired on as their financial analyst. 
My husband and one of my brother-in-laws work at the coal mine and another brother-in-law at the power plant. The plant and the mine have supported my family my entire life. And in my current role with the Montana AFL-CIO, I'm working on retraining or relocating workers who are getting laid off from the coal industry in Coal Strip and the surrounding coal mines. I've served on several community boards and currently am the treasurer of the Coal Strip Impacts Foundation and the vice president of the Coal Strip PTO. My family is also a part of the farm and ranch community here. And that's another reason why I am committed to staying in the area and assisting in the transition with my community. Coal Strip is a very small company town as the two main employers in the area are the power plant and the coal mine. The two combined employ around 700 people plus another 50 to 75 permanent contractors. The average wage here in Coal Strip is $85 to $100,000 a year plus healthcare and retirement benefits. The plant and mine have a mine mouth operation, meaning the coal is shipped from the mine over a conveyor belt literally across the street to the plant. The Coal Strip power plant is the mine's only customer, and with the decrease in need for the coal, we are faced with the need to diversify. The next largest employer in our community is the public school system. When the plants were being built, population spiked to over 8,000 people, but the population of Coal Strip leveled off around 2,200, and that's where we are today. We're a very isolated um, community, about two hours southeast of Billings, so FedEx overnight, uh, usually takes more than one day and our nearest Walmart is about 90 miles away. Um, this is how I try to explain the remoteness of where we live. So people can't just find a new job and commute from Coal Strip. Um, two of our four power plant units closed in January 2020 and the fate of the remaining two are unknown at this time. There are six owners of the remaining two units which makes things even more complicated. Northwestern Energy is trying to purchase more stake in Unit 4 to continue producing power longer. Um, but companies on the West Coast, such as Puget, Avista, Portland General, and Pacificor, need to reduce their stake in Coal Strip in the upcoming years due to their local state regulations. We have a free fitness center, free fitness classes, tons of parks, a trail system, free golf course, state-of-the-art medical center, and exceptional schools and teachers. So our community has outsized amenities and services for our size due to the tax revenues from the plant and mine and other benefits of just having that large industry in our town. So now we're being faced with finding a way to continue to support and pay for all these amenities or shrink them to fit our changing tax base. Uh, the Coal Strip community received $10 million from Puget Sound as a result of a rate case settlement for the shutdown of units one and two. And this is a very unique situation for a community to find itself in. And although we now have access to these funds, we must decide on how and where to spend them. There was no direction or requirement given to the settlement, except that a plan for the funds had to be completed by December 31st, 2018 in order to receive the funds. We needed a process to determine the impacts to the community and what ways we could address them with this money. And so the Coal Strip Community Impact Advisory Group was formed. The Just Transition Fund was approached by our governor's office to help facilitate meetings, provide advice and counsel during the process to ensure inclusion, thoroughness of the process, and authentic community engagement. As a neutral party, the JTF's role was to stand in the middle of the process and help it play out to benefit all of the parties if possible. Because the money came from a settlement case, our state attorney general's office and governor's office were directly involved in receiving the funds and setting up a process for where they would go. The CCIAG was formed by the governor's office um, of the state of Montana with members from state agencies, labor, community members, and elected officials. The committee was set up to try to be local, but it was not as local as they had originally planned. Um, and local community members felt like it was more of a political show. On this committee, we had our governor's office, attorney general's office, Puget Sound representative, two state senators, um, a state representative, Montana Department of Commerce, Montana De Department of Environmental Quality, Montana Department of Labor and Industry, county commissioner, and our mayor. And then they also added in um, our Economic Development Corporation, the business manager from one of our local unions and a Coal Strip area rancher. So I would have liked to see them have more 
community involvement in this stage. Uh, the meetings were held in Coal Strip, but were held during the day when the community was working. And so JTF was instrumental in establishing a process for community involvement, which included adding several meetings in the evenings where community members could attend and provide their input. Over the course of a year, the group took testimony to determine the impacts on the community, both economic and social, and developed some guiding principles for the use of the settlement funds. The CCIAG unanimously recommended the forming of the Coal Strip Impacts Foundation, and the reasons included that a foundation would provide the flexibility to fund impacts as they occur, allow for local, not state control, and provide a repository for other funds to be received from corporate and private donors and maintain a revenue stream for the Coal Strip community's future. The approved CCIAG plan recommended the establishment of a seven member Coal Strip Community Impacts Foundation uh, board, and that was to comprise of one county commissioner, one city official, local economic development representative, a representative from the local IBEW union, and one from the local operating engineers union as well as two community members who had to be unanimously chosen by the other five appointed members. And so I am one of those community members on the board. Um, the $10 million community impact fund was set to be divided into two funds, a short term fund for seven and a half million um, that was available immediately. And then a $2.5 million permanent endowment that would um, be available to our community in perpetuity. Uh, this is a picture on the left of Coal Strip when it was first built as a mining community. And then the center picture is one of the community meetings during the CCIAG process. And then the picture on the right is what our community looks like today and what we're trying to maintain. During the CCIAG meetings, specific objectives became obvious um, that were most important to the community. And these became the goals of the CCIAG and subsequently the Coal Strip Impacts Foundation. So these goals were to serve the community with necessary investment and services through and beyond the current transition to ensure a vibrant community in the future. Support the cost of worker retraining and relocation as a result of direct or indirect job loss due to the coal related closures at the Coal Strip plant or mine. And this includes workers who have, who have or may lose their jobs regardless of their geographic location. Support economic development in the city, county, and region, concentrating on business retention and attracting necessary services to the region. And support the capital cost of specific municipal, medical, and educational services on a one-time basis. And these may include city, county, medical, education, or regional services. Supporting people, business, and services is key to the future of the Coal Strip region. Retraining workers, or supporting their relocation if necessary provides a stable future for people no matter where their career takes them. Supplementing economic development helps to stabilize the tax base and ensure essential services and businesses remain in the region as the economy and residents redefine our future. Supporting capital costs help to retain and improve the functions and attractiveness of the community that is necessary for the region to first survive and then thrive over time. After the CCIAG formed the Coal Strip Impacts Foundation, our first objective was to determine where the funds would be held. So through a lengthy uh, RFP process, we determined to partner with the Montana Community Foundation as they had the capacity to manage both the short-term and long-term funds. The CIF then reached out to Just Transition Fund again to assist us with the process of developing the roadmap for the use of these funds. This in combination with our economic development plans in the community helped us form the next step towards implementing the economic transition. With the assistance of the Just Transition Fund, our community was able to be involved in the planning stages of the CCIAG, and they helped give our community a voice in the process. And as a board member of the CIF, we found that process and plan development is essential and JTF has facilitated conversations between stakeholders and helped us mold our ideas into tangible documents. So not only have they been instrumental in the development of our roadmap, but they have also continued to occur, encourage us to move forward with our vision. And we really appreciate them. Thanks, Sabrina. It's great, it's great to hear about the roadmap that Coal Strip is producing and that it may look a little different um, than in other communities, but is focusing on 
uh, best way to um, distribute funding. So uh, thanks, thanks for being here today. And uh, next we'll turn to Amy McMurrow Hunter. Um, Amy is uh, working to lay the groundwork necessary for roadmap by starting a nonprofit to build local capacity and education opportunities in Southern Illinois. So Amy. Hi, I'm Amy McMorrow Hunter. Thank you very much for having me today. I'm located in deep Southern Illinois. I've been working with Cindy Winland and the Just Transition Fund over the past few years. We've been thinking about the best way to attack the problems of stagnating economies, the challenges of climate change, and the loss of the coal industry in many of our downstate Illinois communities. Basically, we wanted to inspire transition in these downstate coal communities. <clears throat> we thought if we could educate people in these communities about what's happening um, and help them envision a prosperous, healthy future based on lifestyles and business models that are good for the climate, economy, and humanity, then we could get more and more people and communities involved in taking beneficial transition efforts. So I established a nonprofit last year to help people become engaged in their communities with climate and transition issues. It's called the Climate Ed Economy Education Inc. It's a 501c3 nonprofit for education on business models and lifestyles. They're good for the climate, economy, and humanity. And we've got a, a, an online an educational website and we've been doing these events and the events have also led to youth programs and an online platform for managing education and community activities. The Just Transition Fund, especially Cindy Winland, have been with me every step of the way along my journey in starting and moving along my nonprofit for education. We held the first kickoff event in Carbondale, Illinois in June 2019. Cindy Winland and the JTF played a huge role in this first event, including bringing in our keynote speaker, an expert from the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis, to talk about the structural decline of the US coal industry. Carbondale, as you can tell by the name, has a long history with coal mining and power plants, and Southern Illinois University in Carbondale used to get a lot of funding related to coal research. While we're still while there are still a few coal plants operating in Southern Illinois, most are facing closures and people are losing their jobs. At our event, we covered topics in clean energy, funding available for economic diversification efforts, and new areas of innovation that could be interesting for the region to explore. The event was well attended by a diverse audience of stakeholders. There was a lot of good networking thanks to the inclusion of a community forum for businesses and organizations, local ones. In Carbondale, educational events have continued through the community coalition that was formed at the kickoff event. And also we're attempting to ensure that employees at coal plants losing their jobs are getting the opportunity for a just transition. This slide shows all the videos and presentations from the day's events, which are available on the Climate Economies website. We can use these materials for helping people in other communities with ideas that might work for them. This event was pre-COVID, so we had a nice venue for getting everyone together in person. Something that was very important to us for these events is to make sure we're reaching all the community stakeholders. We don't wanna leave anyone out of these efforts. Stakeholder groups include residents, including co-workers and communities of color, community groups, government agencies, business owners and entrepreneurs, educators and administrators, and electric utilities and renewable energy companies. The interest may be in their own lives or as part of the regular work, whether it be for an agency, a business, or an educational institution. For the kickoff in Carbondale, um, we had all of the above and representatives of the Carbondale Sunrise Youth in attendance and these youngsters getting started at a very early age. So I would call that a success. They were definitely our youngest attendees. The purpose of the second round of kickoffs in 2020 is to open the door into two new communities or regions in downstate Illinois that have been affected by the downturn in the coal industry. We wanna introduce new ideas for economic diversification through clean energy and innovative climate economy ventures where business models are good for the climate economy and humanity. The goal of kickoffs is to help individuals and communities find their niche in the climate economy then organize initiatives based on their own priorities and feelings around these new changes and opportunities brought about by climate change and, and using the climate economy approach. 
in the Metro East area of Southern Illinois, just east of St. Louis, we have the city of East St. Louis that has long suffered from air and ground pollution from the local coal industry, especially communities of color. And also another coal plant closed down last year in East Alton. We formed a coalition of organizations that could help bring together the stakeholders in the community and help determine focus areas. We focused in on regenerative agriculture, local community investment and funding, and we're still in progress. As part of the adjustment required due to COVID-19, the Climate Economy built the Climate Economy Action Network or CLEAN Network. We're using this to provide online education and tools for organizing community projects to get people out working in their communities. These events have taken place during the COVID-19 pandemic like I said, and so we, we changed our format. We went from one big in-person event to three smaller online events. And no matter the venue, we're, we've tried to bring in inspirational speakers that bring up ideas that are new to many people, including myself, in order to get people thinking and broadening their horizons. Then we have local people from the community to talk about what their real challenges are, what they're facing every day, things that are working, things that aren't. For the first event, we had three local regenerative farmers participate in the discussion panel. These presentations are all online. The second event in the Metro East with a focus on local investment and funding strategies had locals with experience, including Connie Frace Burlock, who's at SIU Edwardsville's uh, Successful community, Communities Collaborative, Darissa Davis, an educator and a local visionary, and Stephanie Taylor, the president and CEO of Community Development Sustainability Solutions in East St. Louis. As I mentioned, our community partners listed here have played a key role in determining the content of the events and helping to promote them. Additional insight was provided by the Croton Institute and of course, Cindy Winland from the Just Transition Fund. So the point is things are changing and people need to be prepared and we all have to do the best we can to help. The Just Transition Fund helped me build a nonprofit to help people become educated about and engaged in their communities with climate and transition issues. And starting in coal communities, we will help every individual and community learn to thrive authentically as we transition to business models and lifestyles that are good for the climate, economy, and humanity. Thanks again to the Just Transition Fund. Well, thanks so much, Amy, and to all of our speakers. Um, if we can go ahead and speakers, maybe we can turn our videos on and we can move into the um, question portion um, of the event. We can all get on here. Um, so we had, so again, thanks to everyone um, for joining us today. And um, we had one question come through on the chat box um, that I'm gonna pass to my colleague, Cindy Winland to answer. So um, it's identifying that Navajo Nation and Hopi tribes have been hit by coal plant and mine closures and wondering if the Just Transition Fund is working. Um, if we had not been invited by the government. So Cindy. Sure, thanks Emily. Uh, yes, we have been supporting the uh, tribal organizations. We've actually been working on the uh, NGS issues since 2015. Um, and it is one of our largest investment areas. Uh, we've helped connect the Navajo groups with expert legal resources. and We've supported a number of exchanges. Uh, we've provided workforce grants to train people to install off-grid solar panels and grants to support uh, Navajo entrepreneurs. So we've been heavily involved there for quite some time. Thanks, Cindy. Um, so yeah, please feel free to enter uh, other questions that you might have in the chat box for uh, the transition fund or for our panelists. Um, another question uh, was for Audrey um, in Minnesota. Could you talk a little bit more about how the impact analysis is being used right now um, and how it might be affecting things legislatively? Sure, thanks Emily. Um, so our, there, the two separate analyses were kind of staggered in their release. And so the CEE report, which was prim primarily qualitative, was released in February. And then the quantitative reports from UCB were released in April. So, as you can imagine, there was a pretty big event in March. Um, so we kind of lucked out on timing with the qualitative report, and we were able to use that at the legislature to kind of educate people about the need. And I think those 
um, personal stories and community stories were really compelling and helped. And so we were able to get legislation through that provides funding for um, communities to do transition planning and then implement some of those efforts. Um, however, after that, we, we really haven't seen um, much go through the legislature. Of course, legislators reasonably so are very focused on responding to COVID-19, both from a public health standpoint and an economic standpoint. Um, but those reports have actually really been used um, and referenced quite a bit by some of our utility regulators. So from our Public Utilities Commission and also the Minnesota Department of Commerce. And so I think that um, as resource planning processes move forward this year for Excel Energy and then next year for Minnesota Power, that regulators are going to really rely on some of the information that they can get from those analyses to make decisions um, and weigh alternative scenarios. Thanks. Um, well, not seeing any other questions come through the chat box, I guess one final um, question for the panelists is, you know, we have um, a lot of folks on the webinar who might, again, just be fine, learning of um, a, a transitioning industry in their community. If uh, you have one piece of advice or one um, final um, word for our participants today, um, maybe we can just go down the line. Um, we can go kind of in reverse order. So, um, Amy, any, any final thoughts you wanted to share? Um, yeah, I just say for everybody just to be courageous and, and I mean, go out in your community, see what's going on and be a catalyst for, for this type of thing. Um, somebody, you know, we just need, this really needs to happen. And so, um, whoever can get out there and do it would be great. Great. Sabrina, any final thoughts? Yep. I would just say it's so important to involve community members in the decisions for the community. And you would not believe the creative ideas that can come out in some of those sessions. Thanks, Sabrina. Um, Audrey? Yeah, not to be a commercial for Just Transition Fund, but if you really don't know where to start, <laughs> I would call the Just Transition Fund because I think, you know, you guys have the best practices in mind and can help guide. I was new to this work. Um, and it kind of fell into my lap and was a, a wonderful experience. And I felt like uh, Cindy really helped guide us through the process and to understand what pieces were most important to focus on. Um, so if you're really starting from scratch, I would, that would be my move. Thanks, Audrey. And finally, Terry. Um, yeah, my first call would be to just transition fund because they've dealt with this type of situation before. So they might come up with ideas that you might not think of or resources that might be out there. Um, definitely look for grant opportunities because um, there may still be, I don't know if EDA still has any that are out there, but look for grant opportunities to help. Um, and again, somebody else mentioned this, community support. Um, get ideas from your community on, on what they think may be the transition of your economic state for your township, city, whatever it is, and um, kind of make sure that it's in line with what the people want, because the last thing you want to do is try to implement something and then have the public be against it. But by far, take advantage of the technical assistance that um, Just Transition Fund has to offer. Um, and that's, I, I guess that's it. <laughs> Thanks, Terry. Thanks. Well, again, thank you for everyone who joined us today. And I'll um, turn it over to Cindy uh, for closing words. Yeah, thanks, Emily. And thank you to all the presenters. We really appreciate it. And as we mentioned in the, in the presentation, you know, we enjoy our work too. So um, thank you for all the, the compliments. And then we'd just like to tell everybody who's in attendance that uh, if you have any questions or uh, would like to ask questions after this of us or any of our panelists to please uh, email us and our contact information is on here. Once again, the uh, webinar is recorded and it will be on our website. Um, and we really appreciate your time. So thanks very much. <laughs>